Good morning. It's uh, good to be here, although you'll realise that I'm not actually here. I'm on a video because, um, as you've probably heard by now, Steve has got COVID and we all felt it would be wiser for me not to be in the building, given that I've been with him all the time he's had it and um, who knows. The passage I've been given this morning is from Matthew 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When I first saw it, I thought, oh heck, what am I going to talk about? There's only there's so little there, there's only one verse. But the more I've thought about it and prayed about it, and the more I've got into it, the more I've come to realise that this is really fundamental. This is the core of what Christian life is about. I don't think I'd ever quite realised it in that way before. I've read these Beatitudes many times. I've even spoken about them. I've been inspired by them. But I don't think I'd ever quite realised how key this first one is to everything else. Over the past couple of sermons, Mike's introduced us to the Sermon on the Mount, and this is now the first verse that we're really looking at. If you haven't seen, didn't hear Mike, or didn't have the opportunity, then please do think about going back and um, watching those, because I think they will help you to understand what's happening now and, and the verses that we follow that follow. So this is the first of a, a set of statements which we tend to call the Beatitudes. The Cambridge English Dictionary describes the, describes the word Beatitude as the complete happiness that comes from being blessed and adds that this equals being made holy by God. Who doesn't want to be made holy by God? So these state statements, which all begin blessed, speak of a blessedness, a holiness that we find in God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? Let's start with what it doesn't mean. Is Jesus saying we have to make a real effort to become poor in spirit? To live like this in our own strength is impossible. We can't do it. To try and live any of these beatitudes in our own strength would just result in total failure. This is for Christians and it's only possible because we have the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. This is a job that God does with us, not something that we do on our own. A few months ago, a man called Martin Hibbert set out to climb the mountain Kilimanjaro in Africa. He wanted to raise money for charity and he desperately wanted to climb it. But he really couldn't because he's in a wheelchair. He has a spinal injury. His friends decided that they would try and make it happen. And so they trained hard and went with him to Africa and they were able to get him to the top of the mountain. On his own, he wouldn't have even got to the bottom of the mountain. But because they carried him and his wheelchair some other way and guided him up the mountain, it was possible. He had to put his total trust in his friends. He could do nothing to help himself. I think this is what it's like for us with Jesus. To live for Jesus in our own strength would be totally impossible. We need God's help. We need to trust him to carry us up the mountains and he is well able to do it if we're prepared to realise that we need his help. If we trust him enough to set off. Another question that's always troubled me is Jesus saying that he wants us to live in poverty. When we look at the Luke passage, which is the equivalent of this, this sermon, uh, Jesus says, blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Does he really mean that he wants us to live in total poverty? I don't believe that's what he means. 
There are plenty of places where Jesus shows his concern for the poor and tells his disciples to help them. All through the Old Testament, we find God speaking through his prophets, speaking up for the poor, talking about God's heart for the poor, calling out people who treat the poor unfairly. It's usually the rich that are criticised rather than the poor. The word that's used here for poor is not the same word that's used for people who are destitute. <clears throat> poor, both in Matthew and Luke, implies trusting in God as our only hope. In other words, it's not about how much we have or haven't got, but about how far we're prepared to trust in God. The trouble is, the more we have, the more likely we are to think that we're in control and the less likely we are to fully trust. So while Jesus isn't advocating poverty, he did have some difficult things to say about the rich. You'll remember the story of the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and asked what he needed to do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus listed the commandments, 10 commandments, and asked him if he'd kept them. And the man said, yes, he had, which was remarkable in itself. And then Jesus said, one more thing you need to do. He must sell his possessions and give to the poor. And the man looked very sad and walked away. His riches were meant more to him than, his, than knowing God. And that's sad. It was too much of a sacrifice. Truly, I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. I don't think Jesus was saying that everyone must give everything away. And for many people, you know, for, he gives us what we have. But for many wealthy people, this security, it came before God. The poor, on the other hand, have far less false security and find it easier to understand that Jesus is very good news. Where do we find our security? For some, it's in the job, education, family history, reputation, friends, or a whole lot of other things. You can often spot them as they're the things we boast about, the things that we make our priority the things that keep us from being available to God. And some of them are very good things. It's the place they have that is the issue. Our culture is very individualistic. We're taught to seek our own happiness, to put ourselves first, to be self-reliant, to be ambitious, to be self-confident. It's all about me. Or perhaps it's about my family or my team. It's not. It's about our relationship with God. So who are the poor in spirit? Well, in a very real sense, it's all of us. Because the poor in spirit are those who are the disciples of Jesus. When we become a Christian, we recognise our need of God. We've come to him and we've said, I recognise that I'm not all I should be. I've done some things wrong. I'm, I'm not a good person on my own and I need your help. And we've invited, asked, Jesus, asked God to forgive us and invited him into our lives. We hand over the reins of our lives and we're saved. Our salvation is, in, is secure in him. It's a gift of grace from God that we could not earn, that he will not take away from us unless we totally reject him. We are saved for eternity because of what God has done and what Jesus did on the cross and because we believe. We are saved through faith and grace. We are the poor in spirit because we trust in God. But there's so much more blessing that we're meant to have. If we take down the barriers, and let God further in. It's too easy to stop there, knowing we're saved, which is wonderful, 
but miss out on the fullness of everything that God has for us. Because the thing is, the closer we are to God, the more he can bless us. He wants us to live the abundant life in all its fullness that Jesus offers. When we face to face with God, we see ourselves as we are. If we risk spending time with God, he can begin to rebuild us and change us. If we invite him in, he changes everything. God wants us to know him, to relate to him, spend time with him. He wants us to be filled with his spirit so that we can truly be the people he created us to be. There are lots of examples in the Bible of people who have known, have encountered God and have never been the same again. I think back to the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah, who saw a vision of God and cried out, Woe to me! I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. And then he went on to be a wonderful prophet, because he accepted that God was going to use him, and it was God's strength. Others include Moses, Gideon, Ezekiel, so many that we could list. In the New Testament, we see Peter. I can identify with Peter, I don't know about you. Feet, both feet in first, usually saying the wrong thing. He's a man of confidence. He's a, man of, he's a man's man. He wants to get things done. He's brave. He's bold. And when he gets it, when he really gets it after the resurrection, God is able to use him to build the church. He doesn't change his personality, he, re he renews it. He's redeemed, that's what he does with us. He's made us the people we are. And when we're redeemed, when we're renewed, when we're in, in line with his thinking, all those talents and things that he's put in us become very useful and very special. So as Christians, we have a choice. We can either be fully surrendered to God or we can hold on to lots of bits of our old life. We wouldn't be daft enough to do that, would we? I can only speak for myself. But I know that as I look back, there are times when there are things that I've hold, held on to that seemed important but really weren't. Ideas that I've held that I've bought into that I realise now were not God's ideas. Things I wanted to do, places I wanted to go. And it was all about me. But the more God came in, the less those things mattered. Steve and I were blessed to be called to step out in faith, to leave home and go and work for a church for the church. That was scary. It was also very special. It was a privilege to lead other people. It's a privilege to be asked to lead people to Christ. It's a it's privilege to be able to make a difference in people's lives when they're facing difficult things. It's a privilege to marry people. It's a privilege to do so many of the things that we were, we were, I was blessed to do. It involved giving up our home and going where the church wanted us to be. And that's scary. Saying goodbye to everything you know and trusting that the church and God, no, God and the church will get it right. God must always come first. The church we were in has something called stationing. Every Every year, there's a, a system where people are um, look um, those who are move, who need to move, which is about every five years, are put into a a big pot, and um, all the jobs that that churches need people for are also put in a, a big committee, and 
they decide who's going where. You do have a little bit of input, you can say where, you can read the jobs available and think which ones might be suited to you and suggest. But in the end, it's up to the committee. All you know is that on a Thursday evening, um, you'll get a phone call, which will tell you that you're going to be invited to go and look at some churches. And it's going to be somewhere between Shetland and Malta. Usually it's in England, sometimes in Scotland. Actually, it worked out pretty well. We found that we were usually where God wanted us to be. But there was more side to it. You see, we had our own house. And we thought, well, we need to plan for the future. This isn't going to be forever. So we need some security for when we retire. And so we kept our house, which I think was a sensible thing to do. It's allowed us, it has allowed us to retire. But it meant that Steve could keep his job. It meant that we needed to be within a reasonable distance of Wakefield. And so we closed all sorts of doors to places God might have sent us. I wonder whether we actually went where he really wanted us most. I wonder what would have happened if we'd not done that. And then on a much less fundamental level, there's all the junk that I've kept over the years. I'm not good at throwing things away. I've had to keep things that I think would be useful. And so all sorts of things that might make good service props and things like that, we've carted all over the place from house to house. And I haven't missed any of them. No, I haven't got them anymore. And I certainly don't miss the time that I used to waste keeping things in order. What if I'd spent that time with God? Would that have been better? Of course it would. So we're called to be poor in spirit so we could be rich in God. I thought I'd tell you another story about a lady that we used to know called Betty. Betty was an elderly lady. She must have been in her early 80s when we knew her. Her sight was failing. She was struggling in all sorts of ways. But she was one of those people who, whose life is involved in keeping the church running. She was so keen to do things, so keen to make sure everything happened properly. And usually that meant that she had to do it. The problem was that she had the keys for the cupboard in the kitchen, the cupboard that had the mugs and the tea bags and the kettle and all that kind of thing in it. And she wouldn't let anybody else share it. She had to be the one that had the key. She had to open it. So if Betty wasn't there for any reason, nobody had a drink. If Betty decided that she didn't want to make drinks that day, nobody had a drink. God didn't call her to this role. But it was her security. Sometimes we can think we're doing something really good when actually we're just in God's way. I solved it by going and getting about half a dozen keys cut, having insisted on borrowing the key and then get handed them round so that everybody who needed a key had one and that was the end of it. But she had a blind spot we have them too. Paul was an educated man, the Apostle Paul. For him, he, being an expert in the law, being zealous for God, was so important. So important, in fact, that he went out and persecuted Christians because he didn't like or understand what was happening. And it was only when God tripped him up on the road to Damascus and revealed himself to him. Paul, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? That he realised. And his life was changed and he became, went from persecuting Christians to being a huge evangelist. In later years, when he was writing to the church in Philippi, he wrote, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, 
I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing work of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is in faith, through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. That puts it in perspective, doesn't it? Another thing that put it in perspective for me this week was hearing about the death of Brother Andrew. You will have heard of Brother Andrew, I'm sure. He was the founder of Open Doors, the house that we have, the work that works for the persecuted church. And in his younger days, Brother Andrew was a man who smuggled Bibles into, the, um, into Eastern Europe under the communists. God called him to this and trained him for it. But he was on his own. Or with one companion. They were doing something highly illegal because God told them to do it. Driving in a car through Eastern Europe, often into the Soviet Union itself, with a car full of Bibles. They were at risk, the people they went to were at risk. It could only work if God was there and God made it happen. Sometimes even he would leave the Bibles on the seat in the car, in plain view, praying God, look to the Lord to make blind eyes see. Seeing eyes blind, I mean. This is special. If God leads us, we can trust him. Brother Andrew trusted him and many lives were changed and he was never arrested. He never got into trouble because God was in charge. It's when we start to doubt and start to give in to our fears, that's when it starts to go wrong. So we're the poor in spirit. Are we ready for that journey? The more we trust God, the more he's able to bless us. It's about submission. It's about being right with God. It's about recognising who God really is. And recognising our place in, the, in his kingdom. Do you want to be made holy? I know I do. Do you want to be more like Jesus? Because that's what we promised. If there's anything that's in the way, let's get rid of it. And let's take that step. Let's put Jesus at the centre of everything. And you might be very surprised at where he takes you and how he blesses you. But he will. Amen.